Hi, and welcome to another inspirational interview here on Artful Minds. And with that, I just want to give you a little synopsis of what Artful Minds is. Uh, Artful Minds is, uh, focuses on the artist's artistic development and growth. And we do this with our skill development exercises, our weekly virtual office hours, our monthly challenges, our monthly professional critiques, our open critiques, inspirational interviews such as this one, and our upcoming master classes. If you want to learn more, please go to artfulminds.ca. If you want to see past interviews, which we have quite a few of now, go to community.artfulminds.ca. And our inspirational discussion today is with Jane Clatworthy. She's a figurative artist based in Earlsfield, London, painting primarily the male form, exploring concepts of masculinity and vulnerability. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate you agreeing to this interview. I'm kind of excited. Well, no, thank you for the invite. So I want to also uh, scroll through selections of your work. And if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself, that'd be fantastic. Well, I came to this whole uh, art world um, rather late. So I was born here in the UK. I was raised mainly in between, between the UK and Africa. Uh, when in about 2008 with my family, we moved to the Caribbean, um, to the British Virgin Islands. And I started uh, teaching myself to paint there. So after about seven years in the Caribbean, we relocated back to the UK. And at the tender age of 48, I went off to art school. So I went to Heatherley's, which is actually one of London's um, oldest independent art schools. And I went with the original idea of wanting to be entirely a portrait painter. And, but then I think, you know, as, as I was at Heatherley's and as I was exposed to the London art world, I realized that there was something more that I wanted to say. I mean, I still do portraits and I love doing it, but I, I think there's another narrative and there's another conversation to be had, I think, within the figurative art world. Wow, you beat my scrolling. That's pretty good. <laughs> and no one's done that before. <laughs> Thank you for that. So the biggest question, I guess, is, and I'm sure you get this a lot, and so we might as well get it out of the way. So there's an essay on your website that talks about why you paint male nudes. And I'll post that in the chat in a second. But in your own words, could you just tell us why I'm, male I'm, nudes? I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the short version. You know, it started when I sort of looked at gallery walls and thought, hang on a sec. There's a real mm -hmm. imbalance here. There is so much work, so many uh, female nudes. And there doesn't seem to be a reciprocal sort of gaze back. The female artist painting the male body and so it sort of started first as a sort of kickback against that that imbalance but the more I, I dived into it I realized you know I, I look at the world and I look at humanity and I see a tremendous imbalance in terms of energy masculine energy and and feminine energy and I wondered how the world might actually have changed if there'd been a strong female gaze to bring balance back and then it was really sort of the empowerment of women and having, you know, women stepping up and actually saying, hang on a minute, I'm going to reject the patriarchal narrative that says that nice girls don't have desire or look at men, don't self-censor. And, uh, you know, there's been the sort of idea that men are the buyers of art. And obviously men buying a painting of a, of a nude woman by inference then would own the woman and the painting. And so all those dynamics of power um, started to sort of run through my mind and I, and I started to sort of turn my gaze back at the male body. But then, you know, the, the narrative goes a little bit further and, and men themselves don't see themselves as, as objects of desire, and they aren't able to step into a space and uh, of, of vulnerability. They don't see themselves, and they, they're also tied by the narrative that's, you know, the narrative that says um, to be a real man, you've got to be silent, you don't have emotions, you know, you must take it all in. And you look at the world right now and you sort of see that actually men are breaking down under this narrative as much as, as you know, they just um, suicide rates up with young men because they, as feminine energy rises, people born into a male body aren't able to, to sort of access those vulnerable emotional spaces. And so by me looking back at the male, it, it's a way to kind of let men see themselves looked at, let men see themselves in vulnerable positions. You know, if, you, if you're in the life room, oftentimes when men are drawn, the, the, you know, the artists just simply you know, don't draw the penis as though somehow or other it's an object of shame. 
I mean, every life, I mean, the number of conversations I have with life models from literally around the world, you go, oh my God, thank you so much. Thank you for looking. It's as though, you know, the sense of shame about the male body that men themselves carry. So it's, it's you know, I kind of want to push into all of those places. It comes up over and over again. Oh my God, the penis is so ugly. Really? You know, can we just look again? Is it any uglier than an elbow or someone's cruddy toe? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, it's not. And, and, and it, it's a narrative that's been fed and, uh, and taught to us that actually the male body is taboo, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, I do think a lot of it goes back to religion. You know, man created God in his image and therefore we can't really unveil that body. And so, I mean, I, I go into it in a little bit more detail in my essay. <laughs> You know, these these sort of multi-pronged reasons I do the male nude. And I'm, it is multi-pronged. It, it, it is multi-pronged. I mean, it's about empowering the woman, but it's also about empowering men to inhabit a more vulnerable space, to, to be seen, you know, to be seen, to be validated. And I had a conversation on my Facebook with someone who took real umbrage over the fact that I painted the entirety of the male body. And, and the, the sentence he used to me was, it is enough that I have to look at myself every morning. Why can't you paint trains? Yeah, where that one out, trains or landscapes or flowers, right? But I thought, how is it to be a man in this world where you feel you're know, such a, a, a sense of disgust, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, we have this fellow centric culture. So one of the things I do is I, I won't paint, you know, erections or anything because what I'm trying to do is separate the um the concept of the phallus which is overpowering from the very humanity of the penis and actually you know i, I say it in my essay just resituate the penis right back in in the male body as as part of beautiful humanity i think i'm yeah. tick, 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 trying to go through my essay in my head are like <laughs> <laughs> yeah no doubt i think you covered a lot of good points there and it you know when i read your essay i thought okay let's get into this so i started reading it and i'm going oh yeah 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 and it made me th think a lot and it's absolutely i fall as a male right i fall into that societal trap that um i'm not vulnerable i shouldn't be vulnerable i gotta hide everything uh, my body's not uh pleasing etc and it's interesting that it is a societal creation because we talked briefly uh, just before we got on and you were mentioning that more of the nordic countries don't have as much taboo about the human body as as North Americans or even those in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. So it's quite fascinating. So I highly recommend it if you're male and you're watching this, definitely go read her. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely an ally for the masculine. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I, I think more women actually could probably do with stepping up into that, into that space. You know, even if you just, you know, look back at the men in your life and and validate and open up spaces for conversations of vulnerability and 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 you know men take this burden upon themselves and you know I have a 28 year old son so just trying to hold space for for it's okay you know for men to say this is too much for me or I've got these feelings or it's and and so painting the male body is just hoping to open up a space for that dialogue to mm -hmm. take place yeah and it sounds like you're doing it one bit at a time right yeah. Just one. yeah so i guess in that sense my next question do you find yourself making progress with this endeavor of painting the male nude um progress yes as quickly as i'd like no it's a tough gig mm -hmm. you know, i have actually chosen a subject matter that um perhaps the world is not quite ready to embrace wholeheartedly and I, and it's really, really hard to, to get eyes on, on the work, but yeah. the people that do do it, do manage to find me. I have had some really, really amazing, beautiful, validating conversations from both men and women. And I think, you know, if you can move one person, if you can, if you can just change one person's view and say, wow, okay, this really meant something to me then my job here is getting done. I mean, obviously I'd yeah. like more eyes on it, but. Oh, without a doubt. But yeah. you know, I mean, it's, this is, this is, you know, this is a long, long game. I think this art, you know, the, the, the idea that you get famous straight out of art school or you get eyes on your work straight out of art school. That's it's. No, never happens. Does it? Well, maybe I can't say it never, it I'm does, sure it does, but yeah. But it's, it, you know, but we live in this kind of instant gratification culture. Too much so. So we think that that's how it happens. But really, you can't get beyond the 10,000 hours. It's everything is just really hard work. And, you know, that's what you've got to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the best things I heard when I was in university, it said, fake it till you make it. 
So you pretend you can do yeah. it and work your way through it, right? Yeah, there, there's, there, there, there is no there is no substitute for hours standing in front of a painting. There just isn't. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, paint, paint, paint. Mm -hmm. um, so saying that now, when you start out with your models, do you have a vision you're trying to achieve or does it kind of come together in the session? You know, I, I um, tend to uh, stay pretty much in flow. So I have no no agenda. So I always interview my models first because for me it's it's a collaboration end of and if I don't have an energetic connection then it's not going to work. So that so I, I will sort of tell them what I'm about and then we'll go from there. You know they come mm -hmm. to my studio we sit and chat for a bit and then and then we just go for it. I put music on and then I just with my iPhone I don't need anything overly particular. They move I, there's certain poses that I'm I might be inspired by sometimes I'll go to classic classic uh, statues, you know, I've I did um, early on, uh, I, you know, the Barberini fawn is a really good one, sort of open vulnerable pose and get the model to take that or I will take inspiration from other artists like Lucian Freud. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I take a gazillion photographs and we spend a day together and have lots of conversations and that's how it, how it starts. And then I find something, you know. So it's always, for me, it's it depends on my emotional state at the point. So I think every painting is a self-portrait in some way whether you're doing a bowl of apples or a landscape, the artist's personality and soul is always left on the canvas in some way. In some way, yeah, for I, sure. I, I mine my own emotional spaces always. And so the work then comes, you know, I've got the reference photographs and whatever frame of mind I'm in, I will find something. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to bring up this one. I think it's titled Wrongful Mythologies. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, and I, and I love this piece for, for so yeah. many, so many reasons. How did this one come about? How did it evolve in your session, if you want to talk about that? Well, uh, actually, uh, Claudio is this wonderful Italian model. Um, he's, he's the same model in the painting there. So, mm. so uh, he's a dancer and an actor. And he took a he took a pose. He was moving and dancing. Yet he's actually holding on to a chair. So okay. He, and he was just twisting. The, the concept of of wrong mythologies, you know, when he took that pose, and I thought, oh, I love that. It looks like he's falling. And then I started thinking about the fall of the rebel angels, and it because I think this painting came um, shortly after I'd done the big triptych that I called uh, De, De Profundis Clamavi, which was sort of based on Rodin's um, The Gates of Hell and it was all sort of tied in with uh, Dante's Inferno. I started thinking wrong mythologies because I thought, what it? yeah, the rebel angels, maybe, maybe there's another story here. Maybe Lucifer didn't actually get kicked out of heaven. Maybe God became this kind of crazy megalomaniac who said, bow down to Adam and Eve. And, and Lucifer's like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> no, I'm out. I'm going down there, yeah. you know? where they, they they're having fun down there uh, you know and, and sort of that was that was the start of it and my handprints are what make up all all the back so oh, is that what that is yeah if those are my handprints i'll be damned yeah and that evolved because i'd started this painting just before in, in the weeks before the pandemic started and then the pandemic started and we all went into lockdown here and so I had the sense of this membrane between us and the damned and you know a sort of if you can imagine it, those hands pushing against the fabric of reality, and it was, and it started to evolve from there. So I that's wonderful. Just, so that whole thing is just made up of my hands. That's wonderful. Now I just wish you wouldn't have told me he was holding the chair. <laughs> now I can't unsee <laughs> <He> it. Was... <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of the hands and pushing against that. I just love that. So I guess this kind of brings us to a sense of revealing and your own portrait of yourself nude how revealing was it to paint yourself nude and then how much apprehension or anxiety did you have in terms of actually posting it for others to, to see none because oh, okay. I, I think if i am going to look back at other humans and if i am going to ask humans to reveal themselves to me it would be disingenuous if i was unable to do that to myself mm. but also as as a 55 year old woman it was also really deeply empowering because you know we live in this world where again the the, the sort of patriarchal narratives talk about made mother crone and 
the usefulness of womanhood as long as she's fertile or useful as a, as a mother. But then I think there's four ages of women. And I think there's the third one is the wild woman, which comes was basically the space that I'm in now. And, and I think a lot of middle-aged women can actually, um, there's a moment when you realize that society is trying to make you invisible, that we should be quiet and know our place. And so using my own body. So I, someone once, someone said to me actually just the other day, well, why don't you use nice young models? I was like, no, no, I don't need to add to that narrative. I can use yeah. myself as a 55 year old woman. And actually, first of all, it's about me owning myself. So it's that coming to terms with my own aging process, you know, and the Kentsuki that I put in was uh, referencing the fact, and it was Khalil Gibran writes this wonderful piece, your pain is the breaking of the shell of your understanding. And so I have intrinsically believed for, for a very long time, you know, enlightenment, understanding, I know, have been broken by life, broken open by life. So I'm, I'm referencing the beauty of that with the, with the Kentsuki. And in the portrait sorry and for those who don't know what kintsugi is it's patching something with lacquer and gold and so she's incorporated into her portrait sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you oh no 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 and so i did that when i i'd sort of at a really really difficult time in my life and i and i was and in fact with this particular painting i think it leads into one of your other questions that you sent painting that i realized when i was painting this that all the voices of tutors and other artists and other people had suddenly stopped. And I think it was with this painting that I realized that, hang on, maybe I actually am an artist, you know, because everything else was silenced and it was me and I didn't give a goddamn bit about what anyone thought about it, mm. whether the color was, I, this was, so it was, it was for me, it was, it was a, quite a, a pivotal moment. And so I did the one behind on my 51st birthday because A, I was interested in two things. Had my ability to paint changed in any way, how I felt about myself and, and again, pushing back against the narratives that say I should be a good girl and be quiet and not have a presence in the world now that I'm, you know, over the hill. And so the memento mori is me, foot on death, my terms. I control gotcha. the narrative. <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> i love that it must be so freeing to be able to just do that you must have a different sense of yourself after no uh, well certainly it helps you to to make peace with quite a bit i mean i've you know i had someone come in and go you made yourself a lot chunkier i'm like <laughs> no that's who i am or another artist who is fabulous but very much into painting beautiful women he's like can you just like maybe lose one of those like can you just soften i'm like no I grew two humans in here, let me just tell you. And those roles are there. I own them. You know, we have, we have, you know, the story across just about every channel is, you know, men are allowed to grow old. Men are allowed to go great. You know, young men look at older men and have something to look forward to. But for women, growing old is, you know, sometimes growing old, it comes with a sense of shame, failure, you know. And so you just have to look at the cosmetic industry. And make no mistake, I'm all about growing old gracefully with a bit of help here and there. I mean, I'm not above it. You know, it's like we've got a gym and you know, good diet and, <laughs> and that. But we've got to push back a little bit. We should be allowed to grow old without the sense of it being a failure. Mm -hmm. And it's something I struggle with. I mean, of course, you struggle with it. You know, women absolutely do. You know, the loss of erotic capital is quite a loss when when you've had it. So it's... Uh, I've never thought of it like that before. That's interesting. Yeah. From, from birth till much later, women are women. I mean, one of, one of the hardest things I found when I was painting myself was to rip out my own internalized male gaze because it's there. You know, we as women are so used to presenting for the male gaze that, you know, the heterosexual male, because I think the, the gay male absolutely knows how to present. He absolutely experiences himself in this world as an object of, of desire going back to the reason I do the male nude uh, heterosexual men do not see themselves as objects of desire because the women that would desire them have veiled their own gaze they've taken on a sort of you know uh, women would rather in the life room would rather draw other women I mean huh why you know oh that's it's interesting. sort of you know absolutely I mean it's hmm. you know they'll and they'll tell you oh because women bodies are soft and 
lines and no the male body is just as valid oh yeah need to look back. that's so interesting so, yeah, ripping, ripping out the ripping out my internalized male gaze i mean i did a painting um at some point and i was trying to catch an emotion i was using my own body but i realized i'd so eroticized myself with the male gaze that i actually i actually sanded it back and i and i'm sure there's a video somewhere i was so furious with it that i couldn't like it got usurped my painting got usurped by the male gaze, not only my own, but by men looking at the, my little peachy bum. You know, I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I wanted. And so what I did was I slapped him, I, I slapped a male nude on top of it <laughs> and I left my body underneath. I was like, oh, sorry. isn't that funny? Eh? That's so funny. Yeah. Eh? A little, a little, so outraged. a little dig in there. That's funny. Yeah, I was like totally outraged. Oh, that's so funny. Now it, it seems that you're um, you're foray into the the male nudes. We talked about your photo sessions and stuff like that, and so you develop a lot of your paintings from the photos. Do you ever just go in raw and paint from life? Um, when I first came out of art school, yes, because I'd done like two years of painting directly from life, and you know it's important. But I find that having the model in front of me interferes with my flow. And I think I think there's a wonderful quote somewhere by Francis Bacon. I was actually looking for it he said he likes to violate his subjects in private and so he worked from photographs okay like it's along the lines of he doesn't necessarily need the people he's violating in the room with him yeah. you know it was it's sort of along those lines but but my problem is i actually am deeply empathetic so if the model is even slightly uncomfortable i i can't bear it i cannot go i cannot fall into flow and you know i've accepted that about myself so because for me the finished painting the once i've got it once i know what the narrative is once i know what it is i want to say i, I need to get to the end so I, i'm really you know once i've done that uh, a session with the model i don't i don't need them there I, you know like vision for is 2000 hours with someone no thank you i don't <laughs> i don't want to spend 2000 hours with anyone you know so, <laughs> no, <it's> like, no. <laughs> oh that's so funny not to mention the fact that you know they get it gets quite expensive, but something like twenty pounds an hour, mm. you know, can't afford it. No doubt, eh? That's what you're putting your kids through school. You've kind of moved into alcohol inks now, and I, I can see the similarities between alcohol inks and oil paint. But do you think the alcohol inks will influence the way you paint in oils, or vice versa? Alcohol inks came about is you know I have a gallerist who takes my work to the affordable art fair. and it's so the alcohol inks are done. They can be done far quicker than an oil painting, mm -hmm. but it's an exercise in discipline because I think tone and value obviously are really just about the most important things in anything. So it feeds in. So doing the doing the monochromatic work and creating form with just with just black and white is a really really brilliant exercise, which absolutely um, uh, follow, flows into the painting. But the other thing that really fascinates me about the alcohol ink is, and this is again, it, it, it does flow into the painting, is my absolute inability to control the mark. I, it, you know, the alcohol ink does its thing. So quite a lot of the process is removal rather than putting on. So I'll put something on, it'll do its thing. And then um, I can't really see it because my, oh, my trolley behind it. It's just, it's cotton buds and alcohol. So I'm destroying and pulling back the bits that I think are important, but the marks and, and letting, letting the material do the work for you and pulling back what you need to pull, hopefully, and it has, it started to loosen me up a little bit within, within the oil paints. I mean, there's, you know, there's a, there is always a classical realist in me trying to get out and mm -hmm. I hate that and I'm trying to kill it, you know. <laughs> I agree. But, so, so the alcohol inks, I have no control and it's the chaos that I absolutely love. That's interesting. So uh, with painting with alcohol inks or creating with alcohol inks is more destructive than it is creative in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's taking the idea and then letting the material just explode. And you're sometimes I'm thinking the very latest one I did where I'm holding the withered roses. You may read into that, whatever you wish. Um, I'm, holding in the bowl of withered roses at some point it wasn't actually working and an, another artist came in and he was like well why don't you try that destroying it so it's I've got a really sort of strong structure and then I just spray and then just watch it all dissolve down and then yeah, hope yeah. for the best you know that's so interesting um I had a question I tipped my tongue 
no, not coming to me. Dang, damn it. Perhaps one of the one of the questions you you were going to ask is the importance of having other artists. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right I there. mean, there you go. That's what that's a great transition there, Jane. <laughs> so, so that was. Uh, <laughs> What's the it? importance of having other artists around you to help Just you that, that your work? Come in and go, nah, you know, it's not working. <laughs> you know, or, or that's crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love having friends that are honest without saying, yeah. oh, I love the colors. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I did. Uh, it, it is it is for me because I'm really new at this uh, invaluable because in the studios that I'm in you know there's lots of mid-career artists who've been at this 15 20 years represented by you know galleries and selling their work all over the world and really have done this the long haul so it's it's just fantastic having a, a space where we congregate and I've got this studio with a big couch and you know, we often have like I don't know artist salons. We're always sitting in here moaning about Instagram. So, it's <laughs> so going back to the alcohol ink. So I guess you have to use that on a non-observant paper like Yupo or, or something like that. Paper, right? which yeah. comes in from the states. The, the biggest size I can get is the size that I, I work on. Um, I you know we don't get it in rolls here. Though I did have a friend who was trying to figure out how to bring in it so I could do really big work. But mm -hmm. it does have to be it does have to be framed under AR glass because. Um, the alcohol inks are not as light fast as um, the black that I work with is quite solidly light fast. One of the other reasons why I won't go to color with the alcohol inks because it just doesn't stand the test of time. And I've done, I've had swatches all over the studio for about six months to see which color faded. And so in the end, I thought the safest thing to do is to stay with um, the black yeah, I could see that because that's that's kind of a more of the modern dyes that they'd use in the alcohol ink. Mm -hmm. So, from my experience, they do fade over time with a lot of with yeah. UV exposure. The, the, black happens, right? the black, the black, uh, sat on my windowsill in bright, bright sunshine, and I had I had control swatches around the place, and uh, the black absolutely remained light fast. And you did mention mark making, um, so it seems like mark making is really important in the alcohol ink aspects, but in your oil paintings how important do you think mark making is i oh, know it's everything yeah. it's everything I, I, you know when i paint i'm i'm absolutely entranced by the material itself so i'm literally sculpting flesh so when i paint my uh, you know I, I use a lot of paint the paint goes on very thickly i'm pulling skin over muscle and i'm you know the thicker the better not that quite is, albert, but, I've, ne know, I've, I've never but, heard that but I'm thinking three dimensionally and I'm pulling that paint over and trying to find the, the mark that is both interesting and the mark, the mark and the paints are, are critical to me. It's that that keeps me coming back. Yeah. So did you handle your portraits like that too? Thinking the idea of skin over muscle and it's more structural or sculptural? Yep. But in, in a, in a non-classical sense, you know, I, I, it's about how wild the mark can be and still say what it needs to say. You know, I could never work in glazes or um, it's so tactile for me. I, I use Kremnitz White, which has this, it's just was designed to make flesh. You know, it's the reason paint was invented as far as I'm concerned. It's just delicious. <laughs> Interesting. And is Kremitz white the lead white or am yeah. I missing? It is? Okay. Yeah. It's one thing I've never had experience with. So yeah, it, uh, it's not quite, it's very kind on flesh because it doesn't quite have the tinting power of titanium white, which can just bleach everything out. But so Kremitz, and you have to use a lot of it sometimes, but I, I, what I do do if I need to lift something is sometimes I mix the two. Okay. And it's quite I, stringy too, isn't it? It has a whole different texture than like a titanium. I white. always think it's people say string you know it feels like butter but you know one mm. of the things i love is when you come back the next day and you pull over it and if it's skinned over you get all that scumbly texture which 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 i love there's a there's a classical realist in the studio and he's like don't those like lumps bother you i'm like are you kidding me those are the best bits because <laughs> <laughs> i never scrape off i just add you oh know? interesting the okay. rare thing that i scrape off because for me the mistakes are the history you know a painting for me needs to have a history oh, and so, so cool. you can see the history of the marks as they're made and like you know just build up those layers and let it all it all sort of in the end knits together somehow or other yeah yeah i love that i love that the, the divine spark i don't know but it's dumb that. luck sometimes well yeah we got to credit dumb luck a lot of times i think well i do 
<laughs> um, we had another question come in. Do you ever feel your brushworks and marks respond in one way to women and maybe another in men? Um, not in terms of uh, gender, no, but in terms of emotion. So one of the things I do know is I would never paint someone I didn't like, no matter how much money they wanted to give me, because there is no way that I could not paint my dislike. I, it, it would be absolutely apparent because I, I think I'm an emotional painter. So I respond to something within the person. And so, someone once um, asked me to draw them actually just uh, and said, they wanted to be part of my work because I saw something in a body that they might like to see in themselves. But, but, but I really need to see that I can't invent it. It's either there or it's not, you know? Yeah. And they may Which not is why like I it. interview my models. Yeah. And they may not like what you see too. I mean. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, every human's beautiful, but sometimes the soul, not so much, you know? Yeah. But I, I don't know. I would take that as a compliment, wouldn't you? I mean. Oh, no, no, it was. Yeah. It was. I, I felt quite uh, wow. humbled. That's pretty powerful. And we've talked a lot about painting. But I have to ask, what's your favorite part about it? Is it like the creation, sort of the initial development, the ideas, the finishing, the end result? Um, I, I think it's the challenge because, you know, every time I, every time I, it's the challenge and then the, well, look, no painting is ever finished as far as I'm concerned, ever finished. I, like it's, I, I think every artist has to learn to live with a level of divine dissatisfaction because I am never going to be satisfied. And if I am satisfied, then it's generally going to be a shit painting. <laughs> you've got to walk away you've got to leave space okay it's, i'm never satisfied sometimes i think it's actually it's kind of okay but i never but there's always bits of it that i you know want to keep changing so yeah. no, it's never finished Th there comes a point when i know i've said what i needed to say and i i like that bit um and then the challenge you know if it was easy uh, we just wouldn't do this I mean, I suffer, I suffer deeply for every painting, you know, because it's, it's a struggle, <laughs> it's a challenge, it's a, you know, I, and the minute it starts, if it starts getting easy, if I figure, if I think I figured it out, then I will change onto something that will be difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent a couple of years doing nothing but paint with a palette knife simply because, because it was damn hard to do, to do bodies and portraits um, with a palette knife to get the nuances. But in the end, that struggle, it was like weightlifting. When I finally went back to the brush, the brush was easier. It, 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 there was more flow oh, I can because imagine. I struggled so deeply with the palette knife. I can imagine just doing that gives me anxiety. Just thinking about it gives me anxiety. I can imagine painting for a couple of years just with a palette knife. It's just... When I did the Sky Portrait Artist of the Year, I did Stephen Graham and I, and I painted him um, with a palette knife entirely from life. And it was... You, you know, I mean, I think I, I think you have. I had to use the brush to go in. Um, so it was a palette knife. I mean, it was it was a combination. Yeah. But it was, you know, <laughs> yeah. So even when everything was on a line, you stuck to your guns and challenged yourself yeah. with the palette knife. Damn. Yeah, yeah. Damn. Do you think you ever try to get into the portrait artist a year again? Um, no, no. I had that experience. It was interesting, and mm. um, uh. Yeah, it, it, you know, it was just a fun thing to do. And I, uh, and I, uh, when I did it, I, I didn't, I really went with an open mind because um, at the very last minute, the production team contacted me and said, we, you know, we'd like you to try. And I was like, Ugh. but a friend of mine had done it. And she goes, oh, go on, just do it. It's really, it, it, it's fun. So I thought, and I'd just done a self-portrait. Um, and so I submitted it and I got in. So I just kind of went along for the, for the fun of it. And on principle, on principle, I painted him entirely from life, not my, you know, if, you, if you've watched it, a lot of people are painting from their phones or an iPad. Yeah. But I, I, I felt like, no, I needed to, um, to do it. So, you know, half the time, the damn camera crews in front of <laughs> the sitter or the sitter's busy having a yak and a chat and a, a you know, so you oh. don't really, you're supposed to have four hours, but you've only got four hours if you can see the, the sitter. Well, that's interesting. That's one thing they don't let you see when you're when yeah, you're watching yeah. it as a consumer. Isn't well, that that's funny? why. That's why I think at the beginning they they sort of suggest everyone takes photographs. Uh, well, that's very disappointing now. <laughs> no, well, I, mean, I, guess, it's, it's, I guess it's a TV production, right? So yeah, yeah. 
yeah. it's if you I think on the on the segment that I was in there were two of us that painted from life and actually the the chap that went on to win brilliant brilliant artist um uh and you know he did it and he did his sitter entirely from life too so. yeah yeah as it should be in a sense I guess but I guess we, that's a whole different conversation without a doubt right yeah yeah uh, you look it's you know when you when you Painting from life is is very different to painting from an already flattened image. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole different feel. And so I kind of want to transition into the size of your pieces because a lot of them are really big. And so how do you start that process? Do you start, obviously you have an idea in your head, you do, you know, work in thumbnail sketches, then you do a study and then you work no, big no. or you kind of just jump but, right in? No, I jump right in, but wow. I'm not about using technology either because, you know, you can't be too precious about this. I'm really interested in the end product. So oftentimes I'll, I will work out the composition on my um, computer. I'll just, you know, just crop it and fiddle around with it until I feel I, I, I'm lucky enough to have a kind of natural feel for composition. I don't know any of the rules or, you know, the golden mean. It, it, sometimes it just visually works for me. And then I will either grid like I did with that one, um, you know, just do the bog standard old fashioned grid or yep. if I'm in a hurry to get to the to the end. I will project it only really because for me, observational skills are really critical. You can't hang on to that. I, I, it's really just an alignment as to where I am on the canvas. And yeah, just a, a, just a brief outline. And then I completely ignore the outline and paint anyway from observation. <laughs> I often laugh at myself because I'm like really struggling to paint something and I'm like you're such an idiot you've got all you like, stop and it's like but it just you know it shortcuts the process you know everyone says oh my god it's cheating no nah, I challenge mm. anyone you know? yeah yeah well it, it doesn't sound like you're using it as a <clears throat> like a map you're just using it to lay down the canvas to get your just general position me, and I mean, you go for it yeah yeah well for those people who think it's cheating they can feel free to trace something onto a large canvas and try to paint it because it ain't no easy piece of cake is it uh, yeah, no, uh, like, Not oh, I'm totally, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I'm fully confident that I can do it from life, but it's just, you know, I came to this game late. I haven't actually got time to, uh, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm in a hurry now. <laughs> That's right. I know. I know the feel and absolutely. <laughs> <Get it out. laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. Here, here's an interesting one in terms of how you feel. What's it take to be an artist in terms of the struggles, the discomforts and the difficulties, especially coming to it a little bit later in life? Hmm. I, I, I think... Uh, for me, it was, I, I suppose, a, 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 such a pure calling. Where, you know, when I, when the penny dropped, that this is what maybe I should have been doing with my life. Every, every day is for me. I guess uh, I just feel privileged. So there's no, there's no struggle. I think the biggest struggle for any artist, especially if you do it full time, um, is how in God's name do you make a living? You know, that's the struggle. I think how to how to monetize the, the gift. Mm -hmm especially if you just aren't using the gift to paint easy sell subjects you know it's um yeah that's I think that's the and the discomfort I think one has to be very comfortable with oneself and many 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 hours of solitude and an artist an artist I'm in the studio with who's been at this a long time he said and you also have to be reasonably delusional because <laughs> You have to keep going when everyone says, you're never going to do it. You're never going to make it. It's rubbish. You should go and be an accountant or something. It's like, you have to believe in yourself. He said to a point of delusion. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and the artists I'm surrounded with tend to be like that. We believe in what we're doing over and above absolutely anything else. You know? Yeah. I so. think that's a, that's a common thread, even with uh, the people I paint yeah, paint with as well right we always have some sort of delusion that, that hey we're better than we are or you know the next the next show is going to make us or the next painting is going to sell and um, that's what keeps us all marching forward you know it's oh, 100%. The I, I personally just want to change the world so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah another day another world right yeah oh yeah. that's so funny another question came in in chat and uh, she asked how many layers does it take until you're happy well until the painting says hmm. You know, uh, it, for me, it's a dialogue between myself and the painting. And, um, you know, I, I once did a really great, one of my paintings I did, that I, it's one of my favorite paintings, actually. Um, it's of uh, the young model with the Phoenix um, tattoo. 
I caught the portrait in four hours. Okay, it was just like that. I did it. And, nice. I, and I caught something so beautiful. I felt bad. I felt I was like, no, I couldn't have done it. And I kind of, thank God I had other artists around me going, stop. You know, so it was just one layer done. Boom. I was almost ashamed that I'd done it so quickly. You know, not the whole painting, but it took ages to do the damn tattoo. But so, yes, yeah, sometimes it can be um, quick. And sometimes like the big purple one behind me, well, that took so many tries. I wouldn't give up on it, mm. but I had to wait 18 months to, to um, be in a technically proficient, and it's always going to be a learning curve, to be able to do what the painting needed. Oh, interesting. So you're in a, when you first started painting that, you weren't in a, you didn't have the, I guess. I didn't have, so I had these, so I have this, this, the, the model is just, just fabulous and just such a great guy. And I, I made the mistake of getting enamored of the reference photograph. So I took, I, I lit him up with a blue light from one side and a warm ambient light from the other and had this incredible reference photograph and absolutely no idea I mean, I tried it and yeah. I painted it and thought, okay, it's done. Had it professionally photographed and then thought, no, actually, it's really crap. <laughs> so I turned it to the wall for 18 months. And then when I turned it back around and I re-looked at my reference photograph, I understood exactly what I was doing wrong. I confused chroma and value. And I was not understanding that what was a warm light was actually the shadow from the blue light. And so just trying to, when the penny dropped, I thought, I'm such an idiot that I like, I never, I never understood that before. Yeah. You know, I had to maybe go and do 5,000 hours of painting in order to, to be, go back. And so I, I went back to it. I was like, no, I'm not done with you yet. No. Mm -mm. That's good. The fact that you, when you turn it around, you actually saw it says so much, right? I mean, you've grown. I get frustrated sometimes because my vision and my technical ability, th there is a disconnect, which keeps me, uh, keeps me pushing forward to understand yeah. what it is that I'm doing yeah that's the most annoying thing about being an artist right <laughs> your vision isn't always capable of what you're where, and, where and you know it no matter how you know I, I have an artist friend who is you know long at this and I was sat with him while he was um doing color swatches I mean you think you know after 20 years you would have actually figured it out but he's like no it's trying to understand something about paint you know yeah and making all these like really sort of slightly not quite monochromatic but very very subtle gradients of transparent paint and they're up on his wall and i'm thinking yeah it, it, it's the learning doesn't ever end i think if you're a good artist you never stop learning mm -hmm. and i hope i never, learn, never stop learning i hope i hope i die have not having figured it out you know now speaking about other artists though has there been one artist that has influenced you more than others or a couple of artists um, I, I, I think any artist that paints the body, I mean, you know, obviously it's, you know, goes without, without saying that Lucian Freud and his ability to paint the human body or at least to render paint into flesh. Um, but there's modern artists. I mean, I, I, I'm a really big fan of um, Cecily Brown. One day when I'm a grown up, I might actually be, you know, <laughs> kind of lean over to painting like, you know, just love what she does. It's sort of abstract, figurative. Um, Jenny Savile. You know, going back, Marilyn Minter and Joan Semmel, you know, using her own body and that of her lover and, you know, close-ups. So, so you know, there's a, many. Rembrandt, uh, I think as a teenager, I probably uh, devoured anything Michelangelo did. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Portrait Artist of the Year, it was a little bit different because you went in there for the experience and just to have fun, more or less. You weren't really worried about winning it or anything like that. But when you enter competitions or apply for group shows, et cetera, like that, how do you, how do you handle the rejection and the, the kind of the discouragement that comes along with that? Uh, well, for the first few years, it was really brutal, mm -hmm. I have to say, because if you start looking externally for your validation, if you, if you sort of, if your inner dialogue says, well, the only way I know I'm going to be a good painter, the only way I know I'm a good painter is if the you know the royal academy accepts it or if i'm accepted into the royal portrait society but then there comes a point where you go mm, no i don't actually need that validation anymore and i'm just going to paint and so uh, i submit every year and every, to various different royal you know the royal portrait society the royal oil painters institute i have I'm, i will submit again to we have the ruth borchard self-portrait prize which comes up every second year 
I got rejected from that with the one with the kintsuki. Mm. And just because I just, you know, take all my rejection at once at the beginning of the year, get it done and dusted <laughs> and put it away, um, I submitted that one. And I will uh, submit a male nude to the Royal Portrait Society because why not? And I do it just because, you know, it's a good exercise and you never know. It's always good to get into to um, open exhibitions. Mm -hmm. But at, at no point, because I know how the art world works now, at no point do I consider the, the rejection as um, a rejection of my ability to paint because there is so much more that goes into curating a hang. You know, if the rest of the submissions are quiet, lovely little landscapes and you've got my, you know, my, my work is not subtle no. by any long shot. You yeah. know, it could suck the air out of the room. You can't, you can't hang that painting with other paintings, you know, and so it'll get rejected. Mm -hmm. but it's not because it's a bad painting. And I, and I, and I think that people, people think that the rejection is a rejection of that skill or ability and maybe sometimes it is but there's so many so many layers to why your stuff gets rejected from from open exhibitions you've got to you've got to just suck it up and keep going yeah you know? yeah you never know which one's going to create that one opportunity right now, i'm actually surprised that because I, I can see your paintings fitting in very well to self-portrait or the portrait society and i'm kind of surprised nothing's been oh, uh, accepted you know, maybe they didn't want nudes you know maybe in a world that is surprisingly yeah. um becoming more and more um, censored, you know, the censorship seems to be going up rather than, you know, we're almost being handmade tale times at the moment. It, it, and so perhaps the narrative, although they're like, no, we can't, we can't have a, fe you know, a nude female body, you know, it's just, or it was too explicit or wasn't painted well enough, who knows, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. When you say, when you, when you mentioned the whole thing about being explicit, it goes back to our conversation at the very beginning, isn't it? It's, it's uh, the perception of the explicity that's, that's there, but it isn't really there at all. I mean, I think, you know, there should be no shame in our humanity and our bodies and our flesh and our skin. We've just got to keep pushing. I just keep pushing back against that bit by bit, you know, yeah. hammering away at that um, archaic shame bit by bit and with that close to the hour so I'm, i got two remaining questions for you and the first one is what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given never let perfection get in the way of a good painting <laughs> you know <laughs> i can't tell you when i was starting out the number of canvases behind my bookcase that i have absolutely straight on they're perfect but they're dead you know sometimes you have to let the divine spark have a little bit of wriggle room to shine through yeah so yeah yeah you know, that's uh, it's or, or never let accuracy get in the way of a good painting you, yeah you, you have to learn to let go oh yeah 100 it's a tough it's a, it's a it's a tough one but don't you think on the other hand it's kind of a double-edged sword that that learning the accuracy learning that that skill of being able to render something photo not photorealistic but very close to it is needed to really and really needed for an artist to take that step beyond so he can break he or she can break all those those rules yeah yeah oh i know 100 percent. look uh, you know even picasso was classically trained oh yeah it, it's it, you've got to you you really do have to learn the rules and then you break them yeah but they're, they're the sort of the framework and and the foundation upon which you then can explore you know when i paint hands and feet they look there's a million things wrong with them i can see right but the mark itself says enough you know yeah that they read his I feet don't need, i don't need it to be any more than it is yeah if i made a perfectly rendered finger or a perfectly rendered knuckle it would die that that is actually one of the things that can actually get in the really really for me get in the way of a good painting is when my ego wants to prove to everyone that actually i can i can draw a perfect hand okay and then you're just going to, you might as well just stop painting right there because you're going to kill it. Yeah, I think we all suffer from that. I'm glad to hear that you also do too. So everyone, it's just like, yeah. oh my God, if you, if you, honestly, it, it is an ongoing conversation between all of us, you know, when to stop. Yeah. Like, just that one more mark. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's the blood running from a dead painting. And you can't come back. <laughs> That's funny. No undo. You almost need you to have know? a deal with all your studio mates there and have them come in every 10 minutes to see if you're ready to stop or not, right? All of us in and out of each other's studios. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one, and I hope the answer is different from the previous one, is what is your best piece of advice for an artist in this day and age or any artist? To paint with an authentic voice. Hmm. To really lean into your integrity and um, don't let anyone else tell you 
that you should or shouldn't paint something. Okay, if you wanna paint pink unicorns with rainbows, paint it. But paint it with integrity and from a very authentic place. And I think the world responds to that. Doesn't matter what you paint, if it's painted with authenticity and feeling and it's your voice, however that voice is expressed, it will find its audience. Believe in it. You know, I think, I, I think that self-belief is critical. Lean into your own language and own it. And with that, our hour is up. And if you're interested in seeing Jane's work, you can see her on her website at janeclatworthy.com. You can also check her out on Instagram. Her handle on Instagram is Jane C underscore art. And of course, when you're on her website, you have to check out her essay, uh, Why the Male Nude. So what I'm going to do is just because I think it's nice to share everyone, all these artists that I talk about, I'm yeah. just going to put their Insta accounts right there. You can go and have a look. Some of my studio mates. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you so much. I think, I think, you know, we all have to uplift each other and share each other's you know skills in that wherever we can as artists absolutely we should all follow and share each other and learn from each other and with that i i a heartfelt thank you for thank letting me interview you. today i i just I, I i can't recommend enough people reading that essay especially if you're a male um i can't recommend enough following you and and, and watching your work i find it very inspiring myself and i was very tickled pink that you said yes this interview so thank you very much oh, i was tickled pink to be asked <laughs> <laughs> there we go eh? uh, oh, and Michael, with that oh, i appreciate it all right everyone all right. take care of yourself all right thank you for coming in <laughs> bye now bye